Well, welcome everybody. My name is Tim Gibson and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the King's College in New York City. You know, the, the mission of the college, I will often describe as one that is twofold. It's not just preparing our students, but it's also supporting our faculty as they speak and write on pertinent issues in the public square. Not just today, but over the next uh, three Thursdays in a row, where we'll be hosting a series of webinars on how epidemics have changed history. It's a particularly uh, poignant topic and one that, uh, that I'm certain we'll all learn together uh, a lot from our, our faculty uh, about how, not only how uh, history has been changed by epidemics, but how the, they, we might learn about our current COVID-19 situation going forward. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator today, uh, our Associate Professor of English and Literature, Dr. Ethan Campbell. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ethan Campbell. Uh, I'm an English professor here at the King's College and the coordinator of our English major. Uh, as President Gibson said, uh, today we're starting the first of our three panel discussions with King's professors about epidemics throughout history. You know, as we know, we're in the middle of a, a global crisis and a tragedy right now. Uh, we can see how serious it is just by the fact that we're holding this discussion online. Um, you know, we're all trying to prevent this, this deadly disease, the coronavirus, from spreading any further. But millions of people around the world have already been affected. Um, here in New York City, uh, medical facilities are, are overwhelmed and thousands of people have, have died. So it's a sad time, it's a frightening time, and we know that our world is going to change in some way. We know that our nation is gonna change um, in the wake of the coronavirus, but right now we're still right in the middle of it, so we can't predict exactly how things will change. And it's natural in a time like this to look to the past, um, to other moments in history where similar uh, traumatic events uh, took place and see what happened to people, um, how they responded, how things changed for them afterward. And that's what our panel of uh, professors is going to do today. We're looking back to a time nearly 700 years ago um, to the bubonic plague or the Black Death epidemic of the 14th century. So let me just uh, lay the, the groundwork here with some, some brief information, then I'll turn things over to our panelists. Uh, in the year 1347, people in Southern Europe, starting in Sicily and then in Italy, started dying of a mysterious disease. Uh, it caused fever and coughing and shortness of breath. But the telltale sign was uh, rashes and blisters under the skin, which would sometimes break open. Uh, these blisters were, were called bubbos, which is where we get the word uh, bubonic plague, though that wasn't actually a term that people would use for it until, uh, you know, a few hundred years later. Um, at the time, in the 14th century, in the English language, uh, people just called it the pestilence. Uh, by the time of Shakespeare in the, the early 1600s, um, smaller outbreaks of the bubonic plague were still uh, taking place and would cause public officials to, to shut down theaters and other public events. And by then it had come to be known as the Black Plague or simply the Black Death. Um, it was an especially gruesome disease and it was incredibly lethal. Um, between the years of 1347 and 1353, it claimed the lives of somewhere between 100 million and 200 million people worldwide. Uh, it traveled north all the way to England and Northern Europe um, in 1349 and 1350. Um, after that, it swept across Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, it may have originated in Central Asia. The scholars don't know for sure, um, but it traveled very quickly in any case, and it was probably spread by fleas that traveled on animals like dogs and rats. But millions of people died uh, across Asia, India, the Middle East, and Northern Africa in the same time period ended from going further south in Africa by the, the Sahara Desert. Um, obviously, the estimates that, that I just gave are, are, you know, have a huge range because we don't have precise numbers um, from that period of history, but most scholars believe that at least one-third of the population of Europe died. Some think it was more. Um, at least half of the people living in Paris and France um, died. Uh, in Italy and other Mediterranean countries, um, in cities such as Florence, 
um, the death rate was as high as 80%. Uh, the Italian writer Boccaccio wrote a very striking eyewitness description of the devastation in Florence um, in the opening pages of his book, The Decameron. Uh, as you can imagine, this had a profound impact on European society, from economics to politics to religion to art and literature. And that is what our panelists are going to talk about this afternoon. So we will start with Dr. Robert Carl, a professor of theology, who will focus on religion and how the Black Death prepared the way for reform in the church. Uh, welcome, Dr. Carl. Uh, then after that, Dr. Steele Brand, assistant professor of history, hello there, <laughs> who will discuss uh, some politics, um, liberty and constitutionalism in the midst of epidemics and war. And finally, Dr. Henry Bleetler, uh, associate professor of history in the humanities. Give the crowd a wave there, Dr. Bleetler, um, and the chair. Uh, he's the chair of our program in media, culture, and the arts, uh, who will discuss how the Black Death laid the foundation for the Italian Renaissance. Uh, each panelist is going to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, after they've all gone, I will offer a brief response, and then we will open things up for about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Hopefully, we'll have, have that much time uh, for questions from the audience. Um, if you would like to submit a question, you may do so at any time uh, during the presentations by sending a text uh, to the number that is listed here in the, the chat box at the bottom of the page. Uh, and the number, I'll just read you the number uh, here just in case you can't see it. It's 646-355-8946. That's 646-355-8946. Those messages will come directly to me um, and I will pass them along to our panelists at the end. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll ask every question that comes in, but I'll get to as many of them as I can. So please feel free to submit them at the number that's listed here. So to start us off this afternoon, uh, Dr. Robert Carl. Thank you, Ethan, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, the Black Death led simultaneously to a heightened religiosity and a growing frustration with a church that seemed unable to stem the tide of this catastrophe. In 1348, the leading theological institution in Europe, the University of Paris, published a verbose treatise on the causes and remedies of the plague. The, uh, this treatise identified miasma, bad air, as the immediate cause of the plague. And this miasma was caused by a malalignment of the planets. Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars were malaligned. This was killing fish on the Earth, and this was causing bad air that was killing people. Uh, the antidote to bad air was a pocket full of posies. Um, a, uh, flowers and herbs that you would wear around your neck and um, breathe in as an antidote to bad air. Um, doctors wore these beak-like, these bird-like plague masks. They would stuff herbs and flowers into the beak when they uh, tended to sick patients. Um, Pope Clement VI identified human sin as a source of this uh, disaster. And his advice was that all able-bodied Europeans make a pilgrimage to Rome for the remission of sins. In 1350, which was a jubilee year, Thousands and thousands of pilgrims poured into Rome every day. Some Italian historians say that um, millions of people actually visited Rome in 1350. Um, this, of course, ensured that the plague spread to every corner of Europe. Um, there were local officials who intuited that this thing was contagious. They quarantined ships, they set up war, uh, roadblocks, they um, shut down neighborhoods. Uh, but they had no contagion theory of disease. They did this in spite of not having uh, science to support it. Um, one of the most shameful legacies of a plague was vicious anti-Jewish violence. 
there was a rumor spread in Europe that Jews were poisoning the wells of Christians. And hundreds and hundreds of villages in the Rhine Valley were decimated, and thousands of Jews were executed. Um, Pope Clement tried to stop these pogroms. He said that the rumor about poisoning wells of Christians is of the devil. I mean, and he also said that it makes no sense that Jews are causing the Black Death. Jews are dying in equal numbers to Christians. Uh, one of the legacies of the Black Death was that the clergy were decimated. Some people estimate that 90% of the clergy in Europe lost their lives during the Black Death. They died in greater numbers because they ministered to sick people and to dying people. And the good clergy died off first. The most faithful clergy who were doing their jobs were the ones who died off first. Um, the 10% that were remaining were probably people that were not uh, visiting the sick, not administering last rites. Um, the shortage of clergy got so severe in England that the Bishop of Bath and Wells wrote, we understand that many people are dying without the sacrament of penance. If they are on the point of death and cannot secure the services of a priest, then they should make confession to a layman or even to a woman. Um, Pope Clement VI was distressed by the low moral quality of the clergy. The thinning ranks of the clergy placed pressure on bishops to ordain people who either lacked the proper education or the proper moral qualifications to be priests. And um, Pope Clement wrote about his clergy, what can you preach to the people? If on humility, you yourselves are the proudest of the world. If on poverty, you are so covetous that all the benefices of the world are not enough for you. If on chastity, but we will be silent on this, for God knows how many of you satisfy your lusts. The one um, churchman in England who was very upset by the moral laxity of the clergy was John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was 20 years old when he went through the Black Death. Um, and he was distressed that the Pope was not taking more stringent measures to clean up the moral corruption in the church. Um, John Wycliffe supported his colleagues' efforts at Oxford to translate the Bible into English. The Bible, John Wycliffe argued, and not the papacy, should be the supreme authority in the church. He said that there is no warrant in scripture for transubstantiation, monasticism, or clerical celibacy. And John Wycliffe wrote about an invisible church of the elect and contrasted it with the visible structures of the institutional church. John Wycliffe also argued that priests need not be mediators between God and humans. And John Wycliffe said that if the Pope will not reform the church, the king should reform the church. This is an argument that King Henry VIII's counselors would find quite congenial um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 16th century. Uh, John Wycliffe's uh, followers were called Lollards. It's a kind of derisive term, it means mumbler. Uh, these people would meet in small groups and read the Bible together in the vernacular. Um, they formed what looks to us like small group Bible studies. And both the Puritans in England and the Puritans in the New World would find inspiration uh, by the, the uh, example of the Lollards. Um, I'm going to just conclude with a, a discussion of a, de a theological development, and that is the flourishing of a mystical tradition within Christianity in the wake of the Black Death. And this tradition was spearheaded by women religious, people like Catherine of Siena, Bridget of Sweden, and Julian of Norwich. Um, these women shifted theology away from knowledge of God toward loving God. In a world that had gone, that had gone insane, that had gone berserk, we have a hard time discerning God's purposes, but we can still love God. 
That's the message we get uh, from these women religious. And, and they also uh, talk uh, and write about how simultaneously, when we are confronted with catastrophe, we feel abandoned by God and close to God. And we cannot find peace with God unless we go through the abandonment first. There is no Easter without a Good Friday. And with that, I'm going to uh, conclude my, and turn the mic over to Dr. Steelbrandt. Thanks, Dr. Carl. So we're going to switch over here to a presentation and shifting from John Wycliffe is actually a, a really good place to be doing that. So I'm going to talk about both Wycliffe and Occam. So Wycliffe, uh, like I said, is a great transition point. He'll, he's going to fe feature prominently, but we're going to start off with an earlier, earlier Englishman, William of Occam. In 1347, William of Ockham died in a peculiar place. Born around 1285 in Surrey and educated in London and then Oxford, he had already emerged as a great theologian and philosopher by the 1320s. His controversial views even carried into the papacy in Avignon. But in 1328, he fled to the German emperor, Louis of Bavaria, and died there in exile in April of 1347. Why did this happen? Well, to understand that question, let's look at medieval constitutionalism. Before 1300, Europeans assumed there were two sovereigns, the royal power, exercised first by Roman emperors and then by German kings, and the sacred power, exercised by the bishops and headed by the pope. These countervailing authorities had separate but cooperative domains over a world that saw itself as governed by Christian ethics and populated by Christian citizens. This medieval system of checks and balances was as dear to them as our modern day separation of powers. Furthermore, the breadth of this church-state constitutionalism was arguably more Republican than our narrower national forms today in some ways. However, by 1300, a significant shift began. On the one hand, new national monarchies emerged with kings who did not view themselves as part of a broader Christian empire, but as leaders over everything, spiritual and temporal, within their domain. On the one hand, the papacy increasingly viewed itself not merely as a spiritual power caring for all souls, but as a territorial institution with a rival legal and political system. William was well placed to understand this shift. England was emerging as the prototypical national order. It was also increasingly Republican with a bicameral parliamentary system in its earliest stages and a king who was limited by national laws. But this king could also use these laws to more deeply regulate his subjects. William initially came into conflict with the papacy for his insistence on clerical poverty. The papacy was currently housed in modern day France and was running the church like a financial corporation with territorial holdings throughout Christendom. William lambasted a particularly avaricious Pope, John XXII, and deemed him heretical. Now, this was not exactly the way to win friends and influence people, especially the Pope. The Pope responded by declaring William a heretic, prompting that flight to Germany. While there, William wielded his quill with more controversial political claims. He continued to challenge the church's avarice, but he also elevated the intellectual over the prelate and the Bible over the church. He, as a theologian trained in the Bible, knew better even than a Pope. In doing this, William universalized epistemological authority. However, William stopped short of overthrowing the church's sacred and sacramental jurisdiction. He might have been protected by a king and attacked by a pope, but he insisted that either could behave tyrannically and a balance must be maintained. The gospel was a law of freedom for Christians, and this freedom needed protection by, and sometimes from, popes and kings. Others at Lewis Court were not so subtle, and William's protege, John Wycliffe, would not retain this nuance. In William's day, kings and popes argued over power and wealth partly because the world had been doing so well. From 1050 to 1300, Europe had been flourishing. Agricultural techniques and technologies improved, more sophisticated financial practices developed, cities grew, the population exploded. Culture, art, and science also blossomed. Gothic architecture incorporated more beauty and light. Islamic philosophy was introduced as old texts like Aristotle and Justinian's Code were reintroduced. 
Philosophical and scientific debates were transferred to the new houses of knowledge, the university. The debates that William engaged in were so intense because the intellectual playing field was so wide and deep. New military technologies allowed Europeans, who'd been overwhelmed by raiders in previous centuries, to send armies into Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe. These wars were only moderately successful, but they expanded exchange in an increasingly globalized commercial system. The European economy was booming and becoming remarkably sophisticated. As the constitutional order shifted to strong monarchies, it was a good time to be a king. Then disaster struck. The same year that William died saw these complex trading networks bring death to the ports of Europe. Born sometime around 1330, when John Wycliffe emerges in the historical record, the world had been reshaped by death. Wycliffe was also educated at Oxford, and he would remain affiliated with the university until his final years. His political thoughts drew from the controversies that preceded the plague, but their applications took unexpected turns. The plague reached Europe by 1348, and within a year had swept across the island. It struck while England's king, Edward III, was waging a war of conquest in France meaning both England and France were living through the nightmare of a pandemic and an excruciatingly long series of wars known now as the Hundred Years' War. The war's economic uh, cost and growing number of casualties created a morass as the fighting lingered on and the plague devastated both countries. Like William, Wycliffe found himself in the center of a constitutional battle between church and state. The church as an institution suffered from the plague but its power and lands were also eyed covetously by the national monarchs. So when the church tried to recoup its losses, crown and parliament agitated against them. In 1371, the house issued a petition to strip wealthy bishops of political positions. And the following year, a papal collector was forced to take oaths of loyalty to the English crown. The Englishmen were also exasperated by a papacy that was behaving like a financial corporation. Situated near their French enemies and granting ecclesiastical positions, to foreigners. In the 1370s, Wycliffe was part of a delegation regarding these issues. He was handpicked for the assignment because of his outspoken theological views. Like William, he prioritized the individual Christian's knowledge of scripture, which is why he began an English translation of the Bible. But he went further than William. Not only did he condemn the wealth and power of the church, but he also rejected the church's sacramental ministry and rituals such as the Eucharist. So, who then held real power in Wycliffe's scheme? The righteous king, he maintained. This king was the people's spiritual head and reformer and could chastise clergy and confiscate their property. The king was still bound by the gospel to uphold Christian freedom, but his divine authority was now unparalleled. Many people throughout Europe, and not simply clerics, were scandalized by such views. What power would now balance the national king? Wycliffe was protected by the king's affiliates. However, he would be disappointed in their leadership. Kings were not immune to the corruptions of power any more than clerics. The two English monarchs of his day used war and plague as opportunities to consolidate national power in ways that worsened the plight of the commoners Wycliffe was so earnest to uplift. The plague caused a widespread economic crisis that hit landowners particularly hard. Demand for rent declined, but demand for labor rose, causing rising wages but lower rents. Edward listened to the appeals of his landed advisors and, starting in 1349, began protecting them. Over the decades, he enrolled a series of policies, fixing wages, raising rents, imposing price controls, mandating the elderly return to work, and micromanaging urban craftsmen and market activity. The administration took matters too far when it instituted poll taxes on adult subjects to fund the war. In 1381, the dam broke and a rebellion broke out. Called the English Peasants' Revolt, it actually gained widespread support from artisans, burgesses, and leading members of towns and villages. At first, the rebels were shockingly successful. They even occupied London, where they executed the archbishop and threatened the king himself. Edward's successor, the 14-year-old Richard II, came into manhood by stopping the rebellion. He boldly met the rebels and assented to their demands. Then he hinted what kind of man he would become by reneging and executing the leaders at the first opportunity. These unwise policies exacerbated an already grim state of affairs. 
Edward and Richard have betrayed their constitutional duty to gain and maintain the cooperation of their subjects to carry through policies successfully. People ceased believing in the rule of law because the laws had become so unjust. The revolt was the greatest crisis between monarch and subject since King John, whose tyranny served as the catalyst for Magna Carta. The revolt was also a political disaster for Wycliffe. On the one hand, his protector, John of Gaunt, was the hated regent of Richard. On the other hand, his ideas of an empowered peasantry armed with scripture and un had unintentionally fanned the flames of the rebellion. So some closing thoughts. Pandemics might accelerate or slow down constitutional developments, but they take place within a constitutional context that can be quite rigid. William's world was already beset with constitutional strife. It was prosperous, but did not understand and could not predict the disasters it was inviting from its successes and increased global networks. Such will always be the course of human achievements and their unintended consequences. Wycliffe's world saw political leaders use war and disease and the timeless tendency of expanding their power and benefiting their favorites. England's new national monarchy, the precursor of our national democracies, did not perform well from a constitutional perspective. And this would not be the only disappointment for those placing their hopes in a strong monarch who ruled over the bodies, pocketbooks, and souls of his subjects. A century later, this figure finally emerged with none other than Henry VIII, who used judicial murder, legal sophistry, and the indulgence of his own libido to gain recognition as the supreme head of the English church and state. But he was hardly an inspiring figure. So what is to learn from all of this? Perhaps it is that pandemics and other crises may come with devastating consequences, but they are not and should not be conceived as opportunities for reimagining human possibilities. Pandemics don't change constitutions as much as they test them and point out their strengths or their weaknesses. Like our own times, neither William nor Wycliffe's context revealed a political order that would save the world. Temporary measures can be taken to cope with the pandemic, but these must be accompanied by sober reflections on human fragility and limitations. These should encourage stronger commitments to constitutional government. Emergency infringements on liberty must be rolled back when the crisis is ended. We should be modest in our expectations of how we can predict the next crisis, and most doubtful of any who would seek to radically concentrate power or overhaul a constitution to save mankind in the midst of one. Now I'd like to hand the mic over to my colleague, Dr. Harry Bleeler. Thank you, Dr. Brand. We are now going to move from Northern climes and move to the South. We're gonna talk a little bit about how this Black Death um, uh, affects Italy. Well, how did the Black Death lay the foundations for the Italian Renaissance? Two words conspicuous consumption. Richard Goldthwaite, a leading economic historian of the Italian Renaissance, has argued that one of the distinguishing activities of the Renaissance economy was that of conspicuous consumption. This kind of consumption is the spending of money on the acquisition of luxury goods and services to publicly display economic power, thereby allowing the purchaser of such goods to attain or maintain a certain degree of social status in the public eye. He goes on to state that one of the most distinctive categories of goods during the Renaissance is that of luxury goods, in particular, the increased production of art. In this presentation, I will look primarily at the Republic of Florence in its capacity as the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance during the 15th century, and then a brief look at Rome, the center of the High Renaissance in the early 16th century. Well, all of this sounds great, but what does any of this have to do with the Black Death? Actually, a lot. The wealth spent on conspicuous consumption during the Italian Renaissance was accumulated in Italy because a series of economic, social, and political consequences that were the direct and indirect result of the Black Death. How did this happen? Up to 50% of the population of Europe died as a result of the plague, leading to a drastic decline in the labor force. Consequently, wages rose for both rural and urban workers. In fact, feudalism and serfdom disappeared in many parts of Western Europe, as serfs were able to purchase their freedom because they were earning such high wages. 
Therefore, those who survived the Black Death generally had a higher standard of living after the plague than they had had, had before. Along with this demographic change, there was a decline in the earning power of the nobility, whose wealth was usually to be found in landed estates and the agricultural work produced on it. After the Black Death population drop, there was a decline in the demand for farmland, which led to falling rents. Many nobles were hurting financially. Further, in Italy, they were increasingly sidelined in civic and state politics. In the Republic of Florence, for example, the nobility was banned from active participation in city governance in the late 13th century, even going so far as to prohibit them from living in the city itself. Venice did something similar. With the nobility no longer to participate in civic governance in certain cities, we see a rise in social mobility among the mercantile and commercial classes. This newly created power vacuum was filled by the gente nuova, the new people, whose success, unlike that of the nobility, was based on merit and not birth. The new elite expecting to govern and lead was faced with a major dilemma. They were of humble origin and lacked the high birth of nobility. This led to some degree of an inferiority complex. According to 19th century Swiss historian of the Renaissance, Jacob Burckhardt, these men possessed what he called an illegitimacy of power because they lacked the traditional credentials of high birth that would allow them to confidently govern and rule. They therefore had to find a new and publicly appropriate way to rule. They would have to construct a civic identity that would earn them the esteem and approval of their fellow citizens. One of the primary ways in which they did this was through the commissioning of new works of art, the construction of new religious and secular buildings, and supporting men of letters, the freelance academics of the day. These are all forms of luxury goods. And in cities like Florence, the regular turnover of these new men with the rising and falling of the political fortunes led to a constant demand for such commodities. The luxury market in Italy, particularly in Florence, enjoyed extraordinarily favorable conditions for the development of such goods. Indeed, specific conditions aligned in Italy during the late 14th and early 15th centuries, many of which, as I stated already, were direct and indirect consequences of the Black Death. First of all, Italy was developing an increasingly favorable balance of trade with most of Europe during this time. Consequently, by the 16th century, with the exception of a few items such as tapestries from Northern Europe and carpets from Asia, there were hardly any luxury goods manufactured abroad that the Italians wanted. In other words, the drive for such goods was met from within Italy. There was little loss of wealth going to other places. <laughs> Further, the wealth not only stayed in Italy, but it was to be increasingly found in urban centers where industrial, commercial, and financial activities took place. Now let's take a look at how this plays out. An early example of how this worked at the beginning of the Renaissance is found in the Baptistry Doors competition in Florence at the beginning of the 15th century. The civic leaders of the city, along with the financial support of the Guild of Cloth Finishers and Merchants, created a competition for the design of a new set of doors for the city's baptistry. Here we see the new elite of Florence commissioning a public art project that would bring glory and public praise to both the city and its civic leaders. The result was a set of doors designed by Lorenzo Ghiberti that would inaugurate the Italian Renaissance in Florence. Another example of this kind of public patronage is the Brancazzi Chapel in the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. Felice Brancacci, a Florentine silk merchant, commissioned two painters to decorate his family chapel with scenes from the life of St. Peter. One of these painters was Masaccio. His painting, The Tribute Money, is considered central to the development of Renaissance art. But in terms of familial patronage, no Italian family utilized conspicuous consumption more than that of the Medici of Florence. The Medici family, initially led by Cosimo the Elder and later by Lorenzo the Magnificent, had become one of the richest families in Italy, if not all of Europe. Their wealth came from banking and almost every major European mm -hmm. had a Medici bank. Further, they were the bankers of the papacy. Politically speaking, Cosimo the Elder became the de facto ruler of Florence, maintaining governmental control behind the scenes for 30 years. He and his heirs used their vast family fortune to commission poets, philosophers, artists, and architects. And while insisting that they were doing this for the sake of the city and, the, and its people, the Medici reaped a great deal of social capital and were princes in all but name. 
And while Cosimo and Lorenzo would not live to see it take place, two generations later, the Medici would officially become the Dukes of Tuscany. Their humble beginnings now replaced with that of high birth. And much of this success was accomplished through their patronage of the arts. In doing this, they filled the city of Florence with buildings, <coughs> churches, and artistic masterpieces created by, created by almost all of the great artists of the Renaissance during the 15th century, including Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Fra Angelico. Additionally, Cosimo founded what would become a world-renowned library and supported the philosopher-linguist Marsilio Ficino and his attempts at reviving Neoplatonism by commissioning his Latin translation of the complete works of Plato. He also established the Platonic Academy, a Florentine philosophical religious think tank in 1445. And while there was a great deal of wealth concentrated at the top, wealth was widely enough distributed in Florence that even the middling class of artisans and businessmen began to buy into the luxury markets. We saw this earlier with the example of the Masaccio Commission in the Brancacci Chapel. Another example is that of the banker Gaspare di Zanobi de Lama, who commissioned Botticelli's masterpiece, The Adoration of the Magi. The oldest Magi in this painting, by the way, the one kneeling before Mary and the Christ child, was painted with the face of Cosimo the Elder. Talk about social capital. And what about Rome, the center of the high Renaissance in the early 16th century? It turns out that much of the conspicuous consumption that played out in Florence likewise played out in Rome albeit with a slightly different twist. Since popes and cardinals could not assert familial claims to power, the resources of the church were regularly used, some would say plundered, to benefit their families. By constant turnover of these church offices, there created a demand for extravagant patronage in Rome. Indeed, patronage of art and architecture were both a matter of papal policy, and it doesn't hurt to have Raphael and Michelangelo standing by to complete these commissions. This explains why historians refer to the papacy from 1417 to 1527 as the Renaissance papacy. Oh, and by the way, two of those popes were from the Medici family. In sum, despite the horrific toll the Black Death took on the population in Europe, those who survived the plague were materially and financially better off, none most, more so than the Gente Nuova, who were able to step, in, step into the breach vacated by exiled nobili nobility to embrace civic and commercial leadership in parts of the Italian peninsula, and in doing so created a luxury market that led to the birth of the Italian Renaissance. In other words, the Black Death plus Italy plus money equals the Italian Renaissance. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone uh, for those fascinating uh, histories and for all of your insightful remarks. Uh, I have a couple of questions to ask the panelists, um, and questions have been really pouring in, um, in, in my, uh, on my phone. Uh, so thank you to all of the audience members who are asking questions. Just a reminder to everyone in the audience, you can uh, continue to ask a question now by sending me a text uh, at the number listed below in the chat box at the bottom of the page. That's 646-355-8946. Uh, um, I'm happy to receive more questions. I don't know if I'll be able to get, get to all of them. Uh, and some of you are asking the same questions that I had uh, as, as well, which is great. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about how to pull all of these presentations together. And it sounds like something that, they, that all three of them have in common is the theme of labor shortages. Uh, you know, Dr. Carl, you focus on the church and the fact that priests were in short supply in those years following the plague. Uh, Dr. Brand, you mentioned the Peasants' Revolt of, of 1381, which started in part because uh, agricultural laborers, peasants, were in higher demand and had more economic power. And uh, Dr. Bleetler, you talked about uh, artists and, and artisans in the Gente Nuova. We could also mention that armies were depleted of soldiers um, to fight the wars that were in progress at this time, as, as Dr. Brand discussed. So it, it occurs to me that one um, you know, insight we might take away from this history is that when institutions face a crisis like this, they have to find ways to, to innovate and, and to respond to new realities. Um, if they cling too tightly to a particular way of doing things, they, they they risk facing resistance, um, like the, the Peasants' Revolt or, or um, uh, the Lollards, you know, the her heretical movement against the church. 
And you know, one of our audience members asked a question kind of along these lines about our own crisis, um, you know, whether we think uh, that our own, you know, that our own government's response and government's plural, um, you know, response to, um, to the coronavirus will ultimately lead us to a, to a stronger federal government or, or a fragmented government with several, um, you know, localized centers of power. Um, that's a great question. I mean, I, I realize that we can't draw one-to-one -one parallels to our own time and place of, in history since the, you know, the social and, and political and, uh, you know, economic systems of the European Middle Ages were so radically different from our own. But it does seem that there's a general insight here, right, that institutions have to be nimble and responsive to change, especially massive global change, if they're going to survive. And that's something that we could, you know, apply really to any point in history. So I wondered if we could start with Dr. Brand, um, you know, in the 30 years between the Black Death and the Peasants' Revolt, you know, you mentioned price fixing and poll taxes. I mean, those are specific policies that, that were popular that people, you know, reacted against. But in a, in a general sense, in a broad sense, what, what mistakes did you see the English government making that led to a crisis uh, down the road? And of course, Dr. Carl, I can ask the same question about the church. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brand, why don't you start us off? Right, so you're right, it's 30 years. It takes a long time for everything to unravel. And there are moments in France where this happens a lot faster. And I think that's because the French body politic was weaker, whereas the English body politic was stronger when the Black Death started. I mean, and this had been a long development, really starting with the Anglo-Saxon kings. There's a Norman conquest, and then you've got uh, rebellions then, the worst rebellions up to that point in time. But you have this really bad time with King John and then a century of, of relative peace between the orders. And it takes 30 years because the rule of law was so entrenched. But that is slowly chiseled away. And you've got uh, decades of really, really bad legislation. I mentioned a few of them. You mentioned a few of the things that they're doing. They're preventing mobility. They're micromanaging the markets. If you read through the, uh, if you read through the laws and the ordinances that the, the king first Edward and under the regency of Richard II, if you read the ordinances they're passing, it, it's just, it's mind boggling how specific they're getting and managing not only people's lives, but also the economy. This, these kinds of things had not been possible up to that point in time. But it's not until those poll taxes, which started off by hitting everyone the same, they change a little because there are no, numerous poll, poll taxes, and then they get really bad by going back to making all adults the same, regardless of your income, you owe a certain amount. That, that's where the, 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 the whole system just it caves in because people have begun for a generation, 30 years to believe the laws aren't helping me. So I think if you create an environment where the rule of law is broken, by the rule, uh, by the lawmakers, by those in power, that's where you're going to have this kind of um, this kind of uh, boiler that's going to explode at any point in time, which it finally does in 1381. And they do learn their lesson, but they should have been paying attention to all the problems that have been happening for those 30 years. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that for that response. And I, I would turn it over to Dr. Carl too. I, you know, you talked about priests in the church who, for reasons we might view as inspirational or maybe it was just the nature of the job, I don't know, you know, died from the plague in high numbers and this led to a shortage. And how is the church supposed to respond to this? Um, you know, you, you might think one way would be to sort of loosen things up or maybe allow lay people to take on priestly, priestly roles, you know, uh, perhaps allow women, as you mentioned, to take more expanded roles. That didn't happen. You know, the, the church is a, was a thousand-year-old institution at that point, you know, not exactly nimble in its response to change. Um, and so, you know, I just w wanted to ask the question, what mistakes did you see the English church as making um, in the wake of the Black Death, which then led to such vicious critiques from people like John Wycliffe uh, and, and, of course, uh, Occam, we're mentioning William of Occam, and... Uh, and, and even attempts to break away from the church, from groups like the Lollards. Um, one of the people that, that wrote in, uh, that, that wrote a question, and a great question, uh, 
just is, you know, how do you think that pastors and, and people that, that are, um, you know, religious leaders today, you know, is, is there any sort of insight we can get about the way that they should approach um, the crisis of uh, the coronavirus? You know, is there, is there something we can take away from the mistakes the medieval church made? Again, knowing that it's not a one-to-one connection, we can't, we can't exactly make, you know, um, draw a straight line between the two, but, you know, are there things that, that pastors today should be um, thinking about in terms of the way that we talk about the coronavirus, talk about, you know, you know, I, we, we want to talk about God as being a God of love, um, but at the same time, you know, there's, there are serious consequences of sin, but at, again, at the same time, we don't want to view the, the coronavirus as, as something uh, that God has sent us as a judgment or, you know, you know, necessarily, you know, just from your perspective as a theology professor, Dr. Carl, um, I didn't realize that was like three or four questions in one. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll respond to some of that. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to begin by saying that I have a lot of respect for Pope Clement VI, for all of his failings. I have a lot of respect for him. He tried to rein in the religious craziness that was going on in the wake of the Black Death. He c- condemned the pogroms against Jews. He um, protected the mendicant orders and condemned the uh, worldliness of priests. Um, He called for an end to the flagellants, these movements of people who would go from town to town and whip them people, whip whip themselves and and each other. Um, So I, I do think that in the wake of a plague or in the midst of a plague, you get a lot of religious craziness. And it is important for um, pastors and religious leaders to talk re- some sense into people, to provide, you, you know, I mean, Pope Clement's efforts uh, weren't successful outside of the papal states. But, uh, but he nonetheless, um, if you read his bulls, if you, if, if you read his, um, what he desired for the church, they, they were admirable. Uh, things. Um, there, there are two ways of dealing with a shortage of clergy. Um, one way is to ordain unqualified people, morally unqualified people, and uh, mo- uh, uneducated people. This seemed to be the tendency in much of Europe, and uh, this really exercised Wycliffe. It also, ex- it also upset a lot of other people, uh, Catherine of Siena, um, Julian of Norwich, they critiqued the, the moral, low moral quality of the clergy. Um, yes, uh, an expanded a scope of ministry for lay people could have solved that problem. And this is what Wycliffe wanted. It's what the, Loll- the Lollards wanted. But um, in, in, uh, the b- bishops, once they ordained their clergy, they stood behind them and wanted to defend them rather than uh rather than hold them to high standards yeah great i mean it, it really does seem that yeah the the church was was inflexible in so many ways right and and that um, you know these outside groups like you know heretical groups outside the church the lollards or, or whether you're, you're talking about religious orders which mm-hmm. kind of sit alongside the church you know the fraternal mm-hmm. order, the friars the, the female religious orders that you mentioned, of nuns, um, they, they kind of sit alongside the church but aren't really officially part of its hierarchy, that, that those kind of groups in some ways picked up the slack and, and started to uh, uh, rise in prominence right. as a result. For better, for better and for worse. You know, they, yeah, yeah, excellent. And of, of course, guys like Wick, Wycliffe and Occam, they didn't, they didn't like those, those, uh, those sort of you might call them parachurch groups. Um, not exactly. That's not exactly the right phrase to use. But uh, you know, Wycliffe certainly didn't didn't have any love for the for the friars and the fraternal orders. Um, let me turn, turn these over to to Dr. Bleetler. I want to get you in on this discussion. Um, and a lot of people have been asking stuff, uh, asking questions about art um, and artwork. And let me just try to kind of sweep several of those questions together into into one question for you. Um, you know, you talked about. Uh, the changing economic conditions for artists in the early Renaissance. Um, uh, 
And, you know, a couple, a question I had was, you know, does that, does that apply to other arts as well, um, such as literature and music? And that seems to be kind of uh, a question that, that many people are asking um, mm -hmm. implicitly in some of their questions. Um, the, the question seems to be, was there a shift in the type of themes that artists addressed in the wake of the Black Death? Was there a different attitude, so to speak? Um, one, one person asked, did, were there an increase in talk of the apocalypse, of the end of the world? Were people sort of obsessed with that a little bit more uh, in art and in religion? Um, you know, and, and thinking about our own, uh, our own crisis that we're going through, do you think that will affect the art world in some way? How do you think that the art world of, of the modern world will be affected? Are, you know, is there going to be, uh, you know, an expansion of different types of different types of art? Or do you think American artists will turn more toward a, a revival and expansion of traditional artisan works? Once again, that's like three or four questions in one, but uh, Dr. Bleela, could you talk about maybe the, the, the shift in, in attitude and theme uh, in, in artwork? of every kind uh, in the wake of the Black Death? Sure. Um, in the early 14th century, uh, we have Giotto, the great uh, sort of pre-Renaissance painter who began to paint a form of naturalism that was unknown up to that point. Uh, certainly nothing that had been seen since uh, perhaps painting during the ancient period. And he began to influence a series of students, as you would expect. And so they're beginning to copy his style, try to suggest the naturalism, the, the everydayness, uh, the psychological complexity of individuals as they're being painted into a, a painting. And then the, then the plague hits. And what seems to happen is there's a, a real fear of God um, and Part of this, it shifted the folk. Now, you know, let me go back to Giotto. Not, Giotto was mainly uh, painting religious themed paintings, but there is this sort of burgeoning humanism. And it's, you know, we, we see this with Petrarch in, in Italy, uh, this, this recovery of ancient texts. So there's this burgeoning humanism that starts to pick up. And of course this humanism isn't church grounded, but when the plague hits, there's a bit of fear that breaks out, I think across all of Europe, and maybe among all artists, of is this God punishing us? Uh, so there is this shift, particularly in painting, uh, that goes back to just religious uh, themes and, and, and um, uh, focusing on, um, you might say a bit of a, a sort of a sorrowful, uh, repentant uh, kind of image making. That does seem to shift a little as we move into the 15th century. Now, the themes are still religious. So, you know, I mentioned the, the, the Baptistry Doors competition, but the doors for a baptistry and there are scenes from the Old Testament. Um, much of the early Renaissance in Italy, at least the, the first half of the 15th century, is a Renaissance in religious images. The difference is it, there's a scientific approach to painting and sculpting. There's a real attempt to mirror nature uh, to reflect uh, sort of an idealization or a, a, a reality of what we experience. It is in the second half of the 15th century where we start to see Greco-Roman myths or what we might think of as, as, as pagan stories uh, emerging even in Florence. But by that time, you've got Lorenzo the Magnificent who is you know, the grandson of Cosimo and he is sort of uh, reaping the blessings of the previous 50 years, both for the family's wealth as well as the artistic development. And so he begins to move a little bit away in terms of commissioning uh, paintings that might be more mythological in nature and particularly like the uh, many of the paintings of uh, Sandro Botticelli. Um, so there is this shift and even as we move into Rome, it's a real mix of religious images as well as uh, Greco-Roman mythology. The Renaissance popes, popes loved uh, Greco-Roman mythology, and you find it all over Rome uh, and even in parts of the Vatican Palace. In terms of, you had asked about, you know, what, what other shifts might have taken place in other disciplines. Um, you probably know more about the literature side of things than I do, but of course we have, you know, uh, Chaucer's work and um, Boccaccio's work. Boccaccio's in particular that that really is um, a work that he creates in response to the actual uh, Black Death because he has fled the city and is out in the countryside with friends as they're sort of, you know, taking it easy. Um, and um, so there's probably a second and third tier of literary works uh, 
that emerge out of that that I'm just not as familiar with. In terms of music, there is very little scholarship out there about shifts in music. Um, two types of music, you know, church music, and then, you know, maybe the courtly troubadour tradition. Um, that seems to slow down the troubadour tradition during the, the immediate aftermath of the plague, um, mainly because people aren't in, interested in singing upbeat, happy songs um, with, you know, one and two people uh, that they know having died. Um, and the church music is also going to continue on its track. The changes in music that I'm aware of don't really happen until it pairs up with what's happening in Florence and the Italian Renaissance. And that's when we start to see this sort of classicism or naturalism um, that we see in art sculpture is now being picked up to some extent, uh, I wouldn't call it classical music, but a more complex type of composition um, and, and in music. Um, what's gonna happen today? Uh, I don't know. I do think I'm starting to see already because we're all online, this is really gonna change a lot of the way in which we do things. I think more people are gonna work from home because we're figuring out how to do that, whether we want to or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm seeing art galleries, um, while they're closed, are still uh, putting up, uh, you know, sort of videos of their collections, what's for sale. So the art market is looking at new ways. Some of the auction houses are figuring out ways to have auctions while we're all on lockdown. Um, and so those things are all obviously going to be utilized moving forward. Content-wise, I have no idea. I really have no idea if art's going to change uh, the content at least. Um, it really just depends on how how long lasting the effects of this are. Um, yeah, you know, there was a, a couple a couple really great questions came in while you were <laughs> while you were talking. I, I don't think you'd need to answer these, but but uh, I just wanted to share them with you. You know, someone asked, "Are we on the on the cusp of a new American Renaissance?" You know, in in art. Um, and literature and so forth. And then, but then someone else uh, said, are we stuck with TikTok as our generation's artistic response? Uh, yeah, maybe those are the, the, two, the two directions we could uh, potentially go. Right. Um, let, let me shift back to, to Dr. Carl here real quick. We I had a really fun question that came in that I just have to ask you before this, before this is all over. Someone wants to see you demonstrate how to use the plague map. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if that means they want you to put it on. Uh, <laughs> seriously, about how it might how it works. <laughs> Show us that thing again. Let's let's take a look at that. What what is going on with that? Well, yes, the um, oh, did the you just doctors, have The doctors would stuff herbs and flowers into this beak, and they would wear it when tending to the sick. And tending to the sick meant bloodletting. Um, this odd. The odd thing is, this protected them from the plague, because uh, fleas couldn't bite through it. But it didn't protect them for the reasons they thought. They thought it was the herbs and the flowers that were protecting them. But they wore a kind of like a hazmat suit, if you see them. Yeah, and, and I've heard that, too, that there were sometimes, you know, successful responses to the plague that people just stumbled into. Yeah. Um, one of them meaning, well, like the, the word quarantine, you yeah. know, actually just means 40 days, like a period of 40 yeah. days which is uh, from the Bible, you know, um, the prescribed amount of time that, a, you know, someone with a, a skin disease or disease is supposed to be separated from people. It's also the amount of time, obviously, that Jesus spent in the wilderness. Yeah. They just sort of, okay, 40 days. There wasn't any real scientific, you know, experiment. You know, uh, well, that, you know, this is what's like odd. This, it, it, people intuited uh, uh, that uh, this was contagious, even though uh, the medical experts of the day didn't have a contagion yeah. theory of disease. That didn't come for about 100 years later. In fact, I think that the plague may have driven advances in science because um, the, what, what, what the University of Paris was teaching um, wasn't working. The, the, the remedies they were prescribing were not working. And so, uh, but they noticed that quarantine seemed to work. And uh, so I think that they were groping for a, a, different, um, a different theory of disease. Uh, we, got a, we got a note, by the way, here from, uh, from Dr. Hidgley, our uh, provost, Dr. Mark yes. Hidgley, provost at, at King's, who just wanted to, wanted to point out in response to Harry's um, 
uh, comments that uh, he's going to discuss the uh, musical elements of, uh, of, you know, of, of this in his presentation on April 23rd. Um, let me just ask, me, we're kind of running out of time, running short of time here. I want to ask maybe one more question of, of Dr. Brand. Um, and there was a, there's been a lot of questions that have come in asking, asking us to sort of think about what, you know, implications, um, you know, sort of modern day implications. And I know, Dr. Brand, you're, you're sort of resistant to that. You, you like to, to sort of just let's, let's stick to the history and what we know about, the, about what happened um, in, in that time. But I, I do think here's a, just a, a sample question, which I think is, is, would be really interesting. I would just like to hear your response to it. How did, uh, how did the plague or the pestilence affect human freedom differently uh, in the 1300s than it does today, than the, the coronavirus does for us today? What would be your response to that question? Well, I think we've identified the ways in which um, human freedom has been, was sort of inconsequential, it was accidentally unleashed for serfs because uh, this is part of what helps, depending on how we define feudalism, it's part of what helps work against feudalism, but that had already been occurring. You'd already had increasing rights, increasing privileges for peasants. There was also, uh, because there are so few laborers, and you know, mold, several of us talked about this, that means that with fewer laborers, the people who are the laborers, uh, now they've got, they're probably gonna have more mobility, they're gonna have higher wages, their rents are gonna be lower. There are all sorts of things that help their situation. Now, would, if they, given the choice, would they have said, yeah, we, we'd like to have those new rights, but we're gonna lose 50% of the population. Uh, I think most of them would have said, uh, we'll, we'll continue to grow uh, without this calamity of the plague. <clears throat> and I think that's the one thing that I want to stress is that there are all these constitutional developments. There are all these church state developments. They're all happening before the plague. They continue after the plague. And what you've got in these moments is, okay, what happens to our constitutional order. What strengths and weaknesses do, are revealed in our constitutional order? If there's a lesson to draw from this, if there's a lesson regarding freedom uh, to apply to today, I think it's that we really, really need political leadership that doesn't panic. So another study I'm doing right now is on what did, what, how did the Roman Republic manage pestilences? And one thing I've discovered is everyone looked to the Senate to not give in to popular pressure, but not ignore, there's something really bad going on here. Instead, they want them to be there. They want them to give them a good face. They want them to do what minor things they can, but they don't want them to overhaul entire systems. I think the innovation has to happen at the precision level. And I think that all the efforts to do this in the medical world, I think are really good. The trouble is, and we see this with the Black Death, when you get into political leaders responding to panic or responding to some of the worst case scenarios, the most pessimistic scenarios, there's this desire to overhaul everything. And that, uh, that can lead you in dangerous directions as well. And this is exactly what we see with the English Peasants Revolt with those 30 years in between those two, uh, between the, the outcome of the Black Death and uh, the, uh, the English Peasants Revolt, is you've got leaders who are making really, really bad decisions. They're breaking the way people have normally done things. We need leaders to stay the course, to maintain, innovate, be precise, but also hold on to that rule of law. Remember the traditions that have made you strong. Yeah, great answer. I, yeah, I think it's true. I, mean, I think that thing that I'm taking away from all of this is that, yeah, it, as you said, that institutions need to not panic, take a long view, uh, but at the same time be flexible and, and, and uh, as nimble as they can be and try to innovate um, in response to the new realities. Um, I'm going to need to innovate a way to uh, get a haircut. Uh, <laughs> shops are closed in Brooklyn. I don't know about you it guys. Great. That's great. Yes. Do. Uh, <laughs> anyway, well, we've reached the end of our time. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to our three panelists. Thank you to the audience and everyone that sent questions. Uh, as you know, this is only the first of these three events. Um, please join us again next week, uh, same day, uh, Thursday, same time, same Zoom link. Um, next week, we'll have a new uh, set of distinguished panelists who will be talking about the politics and economics of modern epidemics.
in particular the influenza epidemic of 1918. And the speakers include Dr. Joseph Laconte, who will talk about the 1918 epidemic and its relation to totalitarianism. If, you, boy, if you've never heard Dr. Laconte uh, talk about uh, World War I and totalitarianism, now's, now's your chance. You're in for the treat. Um, Dr. David Tubbs uh, on the Constitution in times of crisis uh, and public health, and, and Professor Amity Schles, who will be looking at law and order, uh, sorry, law, order, economics, and health panics from 1918 to 1970. Uh, Dr. Paul Mueller, one of our economics professors, will be moderating and providing a response. Um, also, uh, stay tuned to your, to your email address, the email address you gave when you um, uh, registered for this event. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the recorded video of this uh, presentation that you can uh, share with anyone uh, that, you, that you so please. Uh, so we hope to see you there uh, next week, and thanks, everybody.